Um, this talk is uh, also aimed to be a little bit motivating uh, because I, I did this talk for a series of conference that happened early this year at the Science Museum here at Tenerife. And that was uh, the one that Hector uh, organized uh, regarding the, the Cosmos series and all the 40 years that have elapsed since it aired. So each of the uh, participants, we were to uh, explain uh, one of the episodes and tell the main uh, achievements in astrophysics that had happened since Cosmos was aired. So I based my presentation on that, but it's also a way to uh, to inspire a little bit, again, having this idea of the cosmic perspective that uh, Carl Sagan gave us. Uh, so I will again share this, this presentation in case you find it uh, interesting for, for you. Um, so let's start. Um, I will not go into many details about the series itself because Hector already told us yesterday a lot about Cosmos, about Carl Sagan. But just to stress how important this series was for a whole generation that actually we approach science in a different way thanks to this series. It was a true milestone of uh, scientific and, and astrophysics communication in a world that was quite different from what it is today. But it's when you see it again, even though 40 years have uh, elapsed, uh, it's, it is very, very actual. So there are many things that are still um, working today and they are still true today. Of course, there are some science that has been updated and that we now understand better, but there are many ideas that are still um, very actual uh, today. So I just wanted to stress uh, this importance that Cosmos had uh, in, in that moment especially in a time that was really, the world was divided into two blocks. So there was uh, the Cold War, like very, very intense moments of the Cold War. And having this uh, message of promoting peace and collaboration between the world and between the different countries that were at the moment real enemies, it's very powerful. It's something that we can also uh, uh, use uh, right now with all the problems that, that we have. And what I like about Cosmos a lot is the poetry it has in its script. So really the, the script is very, very beautiful. Sometimes it's, it reminds me even like poetry. And Carl Sagan, um, what he's telling us is again talking about this connection we have with the cosmos. So the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. And what I think is the most beautiful sentence in the whole Cosmos series is, we are a way for the universe to know itself. So the universe has evolved in a way that it has created matter and the matter has organized itself in a way that has become alive, but not only alive, also aware of itself, of the universe and its place in this cosmos, in this universe. So I think this is an amazing way to see uh, why uh, astrophysics and astronomy is so important is it goes beyond the, the scientific facts, facts that we are discovering. It's, it's a more profound um, way to see science. And that's also something that maybe we should try to transmit to our students uh, when they think, oh, why should I study science? Uh, why is this important? Well, because look at what has happened in the universe and how we are here and we are now reflecting about the universe. And I'm gonna put here uh, a clip of the cosmos of the, uh, the first part, the introduction, which uh, I think is very memorable and, and nothing better than hear Carl Sagan speaking for himself. So I hope you can actually uh, listen to it. Can you listen? Can you hear? Yes, yes, yes. Sandra, yes. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Our contemplations of the cosmos stir us. 
there's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a great height. We know we are approaching the grandest of mysteries. The size and age of the cosmos are beyond ordinary human understanding. Lost somewhere between humanity and eternity is our tiny planetary home, the Earth. For the first time, we have the power to decide the fate of our planet and ourselves. This is a time of great danger, but our species is young and curious and brave. It shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it. I believe our future depends powerfully on how well we understand this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky. We're about to begin a journey through the cosmos. We'll encounter galaxies and suns and planets, life and consciousness coming into being, evolving and perishing. Worlds of ice and stars of diamond, atoms as massive as suns, and universes smaller than atoms. But it's also a story of our own planet and the plants and animals that share it with us. And it's a story about us, how we achieved our present understanding of the cosmos, how the cosmos has shaped our evolution and our culture, and what our fate may be. We wish to pursue the truth no matter where it leads, but to find the truth, we need imagination and skepticism both. We will not be afraid to speculate, but we will be careful to distinguish speculation from fact. The cosmos is full beyond measure of elegant truths, of exquisite interrelationships, of the awesome machinery of nature. The surface of the earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. On this shore, we've learned most of what we know. Recently, we've waded a little way out, maybe ankle deep, and the water seems inviting. Some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return. And we can, because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. The journey for each of us begins here. We're going to explore the cosmos in a ship of the imagination. So Carl Sagan is uh, saying that we are now in the uh, shore of the cosmic ocean. So Earth is this shore. And we have been picking, we have been gathering uh, the stars, the universe, but we have not really dived into this cosmic ocean. We are now starting to do so. And we saw the Voyagers uh, yesterday that they are far away from us, but they still very close to the shore in this cosmic ocean. So we are starting this exploration uh, phase of our universe. And, and he they sends us this message that how important this is and how can we do this with the tools that we have. And he says, the water seems inviting and we have everything in our power to, to go into this uh, journey. And he says that we need two main ingredients for that. So we need to critically think, critically question uh, about the deepest questions and problems that we have here on Earth, but also that we want to understand in the cosmos. And for that, we are gonna use the scientific method. So we are gonna be able to reconstruct the cosmic evolution uh, using the scientific method. This method that consists on having different hypotheses that you can test you can repeat over and over your experiments until you get to your result. But even then, you can, you should still question your results and update it with new developments, technology that are coming up. And he says that uh, we should pursue the truth, no matter what it leads. So we should not be afraid of have our 
ideas, uh, preconceived ideas confronted, we should again always question, and we should distinguish between speculation from fact. Of course, at some point, the things that we don't know, we can always speculate, but always based on scientific evidence. And the other ingredient that we need is imagination. So for being a scientist, you really need to be creative, as we also saw yesterday, and you need imagination. So with Carl Sagan, we uh, actually start this trip into the uh, spaceship of imagination, which has this very beautiful shape as a dandelion seed. And this was something that uh, really touched uh, Carl Sagan when they were developing the aesthetics of the series. He saw this picture of John Longberg, one of the artists that were was uh, working in the in the series, and he really liked the um, how the dandelion seeds were merging uh, into the the cosmos and becoming stars. So that's why he got the idea that the space of ima of imagination should have this shape. And also uh, a fun fact that he at, at the same time that uh, Cosmos was aired, I don't know if Hector mentioned this yesterday, but uh, also the first or oh, the yeah the first movie of Star Wars. And I don't know if the, uh, some movie of Star Trek were also being uh, released in the same years. So Carl Sagan didn't want to have a competition <clears throat> with these movies on which spaceship was more real, of course, because also the budgets of these uh, movies is much different than what the series had. So he wanted to be completely different and he wanted it to be more related again to creativity, to, to imagination. Uh, to have a spaceship that will carry us to worlds of dreams and worlds of facts. And then he tell us like, come with me, inviting us to travel with him to this uh, journey. And where do we go with Carl Sagan? Well, we start uh, in, in the realms of the very far distances uh, where here every galaxy is a tiny dot, as you can see in this simulation. Here we have uh, tiny dots that are all well, the galaxies and how they cluster themselves in, in clusters and superclusters, forming this kind of foam uh, with filaments and voids in between them. So this is the biggest scales of our universe. It's like we have taken the spaceship, we have gone to the edge of the universe and we are looking back. And what do we see? We see this kind of structure because the sea of imagination is the only thing that can uh, that, that avoid the laws of physics. So we can move very fast, faster than the speed of light. So we are going to the very, very far corners of the universe. And this is what we, uh, what we uh, see. Of course, we, we don't have this kind of pictures, real pictures of our universe, but with our computers now, we can do very powerful simulations where we put all the laws of physics, all the ingredients there that are needed to comprehend the universe. And the result is this kind of organization in the large scale, okay? And as Carl Sagan puts it very beautifully, every little point, every galaxy, uh, they are like a stew, like sea froth on the waves of space, like innumerable faint tendrils of light. So this, the galaxies are the building blocks of our uni uh, universe, the tendrils of light. I have to say uh, that also in this simulation, actually, uh, we are incorporating a lot of dark matter. Uh, that is something that uh, at the age of, uh, time of Carl Sagan, it was not really uh, good understood. We understand it now better, although we haven't detected directly yet. It has been uh, indirectly detected. Uh, it was also in the 70s, more or less, by Vera Rubin, for example. But we still have no clue of what this uh, elusive particle is. Although we can really, uh, we can um, simulate it with a great detail and see how it's effect from a gravitational point of view. And some of these uh, billions, hundreds of billions of galaxies, they also contain, contain hundreds of billions of the stars of suns. Ah, here is a, a little movie where you can see with more detail this kind of a structure in a 3D view and how it's, uh, our universe seems to be uh, organized. 
This is a simulation that was done uh, actually at the Max Planck Institute where I did my PhD. And at the moment, like 15 years ago, it was one of the most powerful simulations. Now there are others that have uh, overcome this simulation. But if you want to look it up, you can put in Google the Millennium simulation and this will show up as something that you can also use for your students because it's, it's very visual and it's very beautiful as well. Okay. But also Carl Sagan tell us that, uh, of course, at those distances uh, over regular units of distance fails us. And uh, in that case, for example, in cosmology, when we are talking about uh, the cosmic web, uh, we are talking about parsecs and megaparsecs. For the purpose of this talk, we are gonna better talk about like years, that is a concept that we are all familiar with. And just to recall that a light year, equivalent to nine trillion kilometers. Uh, this is the distance that light travels in one year. And also to recall that the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, okay? Uh, sometimes when you tell this to the students, they, they understand this is a very high speed, but they don't, don't really understand the number. So something you can tell them is that this is the same as to say that in one second, uh, light can give uh, seven turns to Earth. So this is how fast light is. And much faster than uh, what we can achieve with our uh, spacecrafts. Yeah. Okay. So again, we are in the realm of galaxies. And here is a real image, image uh, taken by the Hubble telescope. This is the Hubble ultra deep field. And these are uh, galaxies that are located 13 million light years away. This means that the light took, it took for the light 3 billion years to actually come to us and for us to, to detect it. And this light was emitted when the universe was only about 100 million years old. So really, really young universe. Here, every point is a galaxy. And remember, these are real data. And here we can see galaxies that have a more like a spiral uh, shape. Others are more elliptical, more uh, circular. Others have irregular shapes, okay? So we find the galaxies have different shapes, different colors, also depending on what kind of stars they contain. And the story behind this picture is actually very curious. I don't know if you have heard about it, but uh, what the scientists did is that they took the Hubble telescope and they pointed it to a very tiny region in the sky um, that was dark, there was nothing there. And they waited for hours and hours and hours. And at the end, they got this amazing image. So they were really astonished as to grasp how many galaxies are in our universe, because this is only a tiny portion of the sky. Imagine if you extrapolate that to the whole sky, how many uh, of these galaxies we find in our universe. It's really incredible. Sandra, we have a question about uh, whether this represents how this piece of universe was 800 million years ago from Isabel Castello. Was she wondering? Yes, actually, yes. Actually, it's exactly, we are looking at the more far away galaxies, but also the oldest galaxies. So exactly, yes, we are looking, this is like a time traveling, right? So we are looking far away, but this means also that we are looking ahead on uh, behind in time. So that's that's right. So we don't, we don't know how these galaxies look like today, we are looking at them as they were at that time. With galaxies, actually, we are uh, able to understand a lot of physics, a lot of the uh, physical processes that are happening in our universe. And actually, with the galaxies, we were able to do one of the many tests, for example, of Einstein's uh, general relativity, where, as you know, uh, he said that matter curves the space time. And therefore, uh, when light is traveling, it's also going to be uh, deviated its trajectory. And this is something that we actually see in some uh, groups of, of galaxies, for example, the Abel cluster, 
which is located at 2,200 million light years. And here in this picture, this very beautiful picture, you see these traces, like this kind of lines or arcs better. And this is actually light that is coming from galaxies behind the cluster. This is a very, very massive cluster. And the light of the galaxies behind is actually being bent. So this is one of the most beautiful proofs of Einstein's theory. So with galaxies, there are many, many things that have been going on for the last 40 years, and that allows us to understand much better our uh, universe. So this new uh, field of research, uh, the gravitational lensing, is something that is really quite new. And Carl Sagan in, in the episode also tells us that galaxies are actual, actually uh, not still, uh, they have a life as well. They were originated the very early universe and then they have had some evolution and then they will uh, die in a particular way. And what we see very often in our universe is that they actually merge with each other. So they are continually merging and evolving in a very dynamic way. Actually, our galaxy will also merge with our neighbor, Andromeda, uh, in quite some time, so don't worry about it. But it's something that is very natural for the galaxies to feel the gravitational pull of the companions that are around and to merge into one another in a sort of a cosmic dance that is very, very beautiful. This is something that we can, for example, observe in this image, which is the Stefan Quintet, which is located around 200 million light years from us. And um, Sagan also says, also tells us that the galaxies at some point of their lives can go through a very turbulent epoch uh, in which even their nucleus can explode and can eject a lot of material that is uh, very high speeds. And he doesn't really mention uh, this um, exactly like that, but I think he's talking about supermassive black holes that at that time, they were not really understood well. Uh, so he doesn't say the name, but he's talking about um, active galaxies that have an intense uh, process in their nucleus caused by uh, supermassive black holes. And for example, here we have uh, data, a real image uh, of Cygnus A, which is the brightest radio source in the sky uh, outside our galaxy. Okay? And I, I talk about this because this is something that 40 years ago was not really well understood. But now, nowadays, we actually know that in every galaxy, there is a supermassive, on almost every galaxy, that is a supermassive black hole. Even the ones that are not as active as the Cygnus A, uh, also in our galaxy, for example, we have a supermassive black hole that is, is quiet, sort, sort of quiet, even though it's a creating material, but it's not having these very powerful jets, it's quiet. And this discovery was done amongst other by Andrea Getz, uh, who was the fourth woman to uh, win the Nobel Prize in Physics in history. And she did so last year together with uh, colleagues. And she did this discovery and it was very important, but the prize was also uh, partial, partially uh, because of the development of the technique that allowed uh, the telescopes to actually uh, see or, see or, or measure um, the galactic center to observe the galactic center. And this is what is called the adaptive optics. And you can see the difference, for example, in a big telescope of having this optical mechanism that is going to basically correct all the disturbances and all the aberrations uh, of your image, uh, allowing you to have much more quality images. So thanks to this technique, uh, the team of Andrea Getz could actually observe with a lot of precision the galactic center and what they did is to follow the trajectories, the orbits of stars around the galactic center. And what they realized is that these stars were uh, moving in quite elliptical orbits that are not actually usual. You see this, these orbits have very elliptical shapes. 
And also the velocity of the stars in completing these orbits was very quickly, it was very rapid. So these stars were completing their orbit in 10, 20 years, which is, is actually really, really quick. Think that, for example, our sun completes a turn around the, the whole galaxy in 250 million years. And these stars were having huge velocities and completing these very rare orbits. And the telescopes could not see anything, uh, any kind of object in, in the center of all these orbits. So this was the first uh, experimental evidence of a supermassive black hole in our galaxy and that we think that we can find in other galaxies. And that's why Andrea Getz, together with colleagues, uh, won the Nobel Prize. It's a very, very important discovery that has been made since uh, the cosmos was aired. Okay, so we were traveling from the very, very far away galaxies and now we are coming back towards our home, towards Earth. And for that, we have to pass through the supercluster, the Virgo supercluster, which is this one here, composed by other smaller clusters like the Virgo cluster, the Usamello groups, uh, the Dorado cluster, the Fornax cluster, and also what is called the local groups. So a well, local group of galaxies where we actually live. And the local group is composed by the Milky Way, the Andromeda galaxy, and the Triangulum galaxy. These are the main three galaxies, but then we have 20 or 25 more dwarf galaxies, small galaxies, that are actually satellites of the bigger ones and they are actually or orbiting around them. Andromeda galaxy, our neighbor, is only located at 2 million light years, which is much, much closer, just in the, back, uh, the backyard, but it's still quite a distance for us. I uh, think that um, the light that we are now seeing from Andromeda uh, was emitted 2 million uh, years ago. And this means that here on Earth, probably the first hominids were, were being developed. I think uh, the famous Lucy, hominid Lucy, uh, was being born at, at that time, two million years ago. So imagine again, even though la, uh, the speed of light is, is really rapid, it's really quickly, the distances that we were talking yesterday are so huge that it takes also quite a time for the light to, to arrive to us. If we come even closer, we are visiting the biggest two satellites of our own galaxy, the Magellanic Clouds, which are located at 100,000 100, light years. And, and they are very beautiful. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you will be used to see them in the dark sky. And they have been observed with great detail uh, from here, from, from Earth with our telescopes and we actually know a lot about them and the different uh, regions and stars that are forming them. And we uh, come to our Milky Way, which is a spiral galaxy. Of course, we don't have also a picture of our galaxy because we haven't been able to go up uh, out from it and, and take a picture, but we think we, it should have more or less this shape, very similar to Andromeda. And uh, the diameter of our galaxy is around 100,000 light year. And the sun uh, is located more or less at two thirds from the center. And many students, I have noticed that they actually believe the sun is at the center of the galaxy. And it's important that we tell them that that's not the case and why it's so good that we are not at the center of the galaxy, not only because of the supermassive black hole, but also because there is a lot of gas, a lot of stars here in a very small, a piece or a small area. And so the interactions here are much stronger, much more intense, and it's much better to be located at a quiet uh, region uh, outside the galaxy in one of the spiral arms. So this is also for us an ideal location uh, as humans. Uh, from our perspective, uh, the galaxy, uh, the, if we look at the center of the galaxy and we take a picture of the galactic plane, it looks something like that. This is a picture taken by Gaia, one of the most productive satellites that we have uh, working right now in space. Uh, and that is measuring the position of all many stars, millions of stars in our galaxy. 
to have this kind of very detailed maps uh, of our own uh, neighborhood. And something that has also happened in the last 40 years is that we have gone beyond the observation in optical, although it's still a very important part of astrophysics. And now we are doing what is called the multi-messenger astronomy. So observing the uh, astrophysical objects, not only in optical, but also in different ranges of energy. So we can understand much better the processes that are happening there. So for example, again, if we consider the galactic plane and we look it in the optical, we are gonna see as the image before, many, many stars, but we are gonna see also uh, thick clouds of uh, dust that are absorbing the light coming, coming from the galactic center and don't allow us to actually see what is going on there. Whereas if we observe the same region, for example, in infrared or near infrared, we see this region starts to bright because actually the dust is absorbing the optical light and we're emitting it, it in infrared, okay? So this is very interesting for us because we understand different processes that are happening. And the same if we uh, observe in radio, in, for example, gamma rays or X-rays. We are gonna have a much complete image of the cosmos if we continue with this multi-messenger astronomy. And this is something that is uh, increasing every time with the developing of more uh, advanced telescopes, not only in the optical, but in all these different wavelengths. And here uh, I want to show you, because we are talking about our galaxy, and I want to show you another clip of the series that is very, very beautiful, is the mythical fall of the spaceship of imagination into the galaxy. And, and I think it's worth it to, to watch. Within this galaxy are stars, worlds, and it may be an enormous diversity of living things and intelligent beings and spacefaring civilizations. Scattered among the stars of the Milky Way are supernova remnants each one the remains of a colossal stellar explosion. These filaments of glowing gas are the outer layers of a star which has recently destroyed itself. The gas is unraveling, returning star stuff back into space. And at its heart are the remains of the original star, a dense, shrunken stellar fragment called a pulsar a natural lighthouse, blinking and hissing, a sun that spins twice each second. Pulsars keep such perfect time that the first one discovered was thought to be a sign of extraterrestrial intelligence, perhaps a navigational beacon for great ships that travel across the light years and between the stars. So Carl Sagan uh, invites us to explore the galaxy because we cannot only find stars in the galaxies, we find huge amounts of gas, we find interesting objects like supernovae and pulsars. Uh, and supernovae, well, we know there are different kinds, but the ones that produce the pulsars are the core collapse supernovae, and here is one of the most famous remnants, the Crab Nebula. And I always take this opportunity when the pulsars are mentioned, which are uh, probably, you know, they are neutron stars that rotate very, very fast and they emit these pulses of radiation that we can actually detect here with a radio telescope. And the first person uh, to detect the pulsars was the incredible Jocelyn Bell, which I know, I am sure you, you all know. And if not, uh, look her up because her uh, history is very motivating and I think she has been an inspiration for also many of us uh, in astrophysics and especially for women in, in astrophysics. And she was the one that detected actually the existence of the pulsars. And as Carl Sagan said, uh, her, she and, and, and her advisor, they, at the beginning they thought it might be the signal from an extraterrestrial uh, intelligence, but then they discovered some others and realized it was a natural uh, a product of a supernova explosion. And the history of Jocelyn Bell, I think is a bit unfair in the sense that 
uh, her advisor and the astronomer that actually developed the technique of radioastronomy won the Nobel Prize for this discovery and she was excluded of it. So I think it's something that we also uh, should um, be aware of. But what we have more of anything in our galaxy is stars in all galaxies as well. So we have 100 billion of stars and imagine if, if there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, each of them with hundreds of billions of stars, how many stars are in the cosmos? And this is also the, the uh, famous quote by Carl Sagan, total number of stars in the universe is greater than all the grains of sand on all the beaches of planet Earth. And what is more important than that is that probably around all those stars, there are also planets. So when cosmos uh, appear in the 80s, Carl Sagan still uh, didn't know there were other planets around there because it hadn't been uh, discovered, but he truly felt that uh, it couldn't be that there were so many stars and the only star having planets was the sun. But to, for him, that was not possible. And he was right. It was a prediction that he made that probably at some point we will find new planets around other stars. And in 1992, actually Carl Sagan was still alive and could see that uh, the first exoplanet was discovered by Michael Major and Didier Kilots. And not only that, but in these last 20 years, we have discovered more than 4,000 planets around other stars. Some of them are gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, but some of them are rocky planets and some of them are in the habitability zone of their stars, you know, this, this adequate distance uh, to the stars so it could harbor uh, liquid water. And some of them we have also discovered that they have atmospheres. So with the next generation of telescopes, we will be able probably to study these atmospheres with great detail. It's already been done, but with the next telescope, it will be even a much uh, powerful and try to find biosignatures maybe of life in those planets. So maybe we are, we will be able to answer the question, this incredible question that we have always had in our minds, like, are we alone in our universe? This is something that maybe in the next decades we can answer. Um, not only that, we all also in these 40 years, we have learned much more about how the planetary systems form from these huge uh, um, molecular clouds of gas and dust. And 40 years ago, we had a, a very good theoretical model about it, how this happened, how there was some, at some moment, parts of these clouds would condense and would form a protostar and a disk of material around it from where the planets will form after millions of years. But recently, in the last 10 years from, uh, from 10 years to now, we actually can photograph the planetary systems being formed. And this is thanks to the ALMA telescopes that are located in Chile, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, that they actually took this catalog of uh, systems, planetary systems that are being formed right now in different stages of the formation. So this has also been an incredible achievement in, in the past uh, decades. one of the most famous nebula in our galaxy, at least for us, uh, that is very close by. It's only 1,500 light years away. And it's the typical example, example of a nursery of stars. It's where stars are being formed and we can actually uh, have very uh, detailed images uh, in optical light and in infrared to see how these stars are um, being uh, Form. So this is a movie uh, that takes data from the Hubble telescope in the optical and the Spitzer telescope in the infrared and it's really beautiful so I'm going to also play it for you. Thank you. 
This last part is a simulation based on the data, and you see how the stars are being formed in the middle of this cloud. Actually, usually the stars formed in, in families, so it's, it's uh, supposed to be rare to have a standalone star. So sometimes, so many times, they form double system, binary systems, and even uh, triple systems. And apparently, these are the majority of the stars in our galaxy. Um, so we travel, we continue traveling towards Earth and we pass other uh, well-known uh, objects like the Pleiades, for example. This is an open cluster of stars that are very, very young. They just formed probably a few uh, million years ago. And I like to show always this picture to students because it's also important for them to understand that stars have different colors that have to do with their temperature. And to um, uh, make it understand the idea that in physics, uh, unlike in art, for example, the blue colors are identified with higher temperatures and the red colors with colder temperatures. So it, this is important also because sometimes they, uh, you ask them, for example, which are the stars that are colder or are warmer and they are a bit confused. So the Pleiades is a very good example to talk about the difference in, uh, in the stars. And well, we already talked about Proxima Centauri uh, yesterday, and we are now really, really uh, close by home. And something that I didn't mention yesterday is that actually Proxima Centauri has a planet, at least I think it has been, a second has been discovered, but it has a planet in the habitability zone, Proxima B, uh, which is very interesting. And who knows if in the next centuries we will be able to actually travel there. There are some crazy projects that are trying to conceive how we could send micro satellites there uh, that will take uh, maybe 20 or 30 years only to, to get there and, and explore this world. But this is something for, for the future. And now we are home. We are back at our solar system. Uh, we are back at our close back to our star, the sun, which from us is only eight light minutes away. Uh, in our spaceship, it will take like three months more or less to get there. And uh, something that we can see not only in our star, but, but in other stars, is the huge influence of the magnetic field. So this is also some um, research field that has actually improved a lot in the last 40 years, thanks to telescopes, for example, that we have here in the Canary Islands that allow, allow us to um, study the sun with very great detail, not only the surface, not only to see the effects of the magnetic fields in the surface that creates the sunspots and the flares and, and these kind of very big structures, but also to study the inside, to try to understand how is the inner structure of the sun. And actually here in the Canary Islands, uh, there was a technique invented to try to do so that we can, I'm not gonna go into details, but we can comment later if there is any question. When Cosmos uh, was shown in television, uh, Carl Sagan mentioned that there are nine planets in our solar system because at that time Pluto was still a planet, was still part of the planetary family. But we know now that since 2006, Pluto actually has been um, um, put in another category, which are the dwarf planets, because we were starting to find many objects that were more or less the same in size as Pluto in the outer part of the solar system. So we could not incorporate all those objects into the category of planets that would have, wouldn't have many sense to have to study, I don't know, 50 names instead of only eight names of each planet. 
So uh, what they did is to create this uh, dwarf planet category. And now Pluto is the first example of this category. And very recently, and only a few years ago, a spaceship uh, passed by Pluto, the New Horizons um, mission, and took this amazing picture. It was the first time that we could actually see Pluto uh, with a more quality than only being a very uh, small dot with our telescope. So this was also a very great achievement. Uh, we, are, we are in Pluto and now we are coming back and we pass by Saturn, which is only one light hour away from us. And I'm not going to go much into details here as well, but I want to show the new version of the uh, pale blue dot image uh, that I showed yesterday, the one that was taken by the Voyagers. So this is a new version taken by the uh, Cassini uh, mission that was actually studying uh, Saturn and its rings. And here again, this little dot is our planet. So this is something also I, I like to show the students a lot. And sometimes I have a, a picture where you can see the whole Saturn and this tiny little dot. And I ask them if they can believe that that picture is also a picture of Earth. And then you start a very interesting uh, debate with them. So I can share that picture with you later as well. And just uh, very, very close to us, we find Mars, which is now a, probably the, the best explored uh, planet in our solar system. We have many, many missions that have visited the planets in, in the last 40 years um, because we are interested in, in understanding if there could have been life there uh, at some point at the very beginning of, of the solar system. So Carl Sagan was also very interested in, in visiting the planet there, so sending spacecrafts there. He actually uh, worked in the Vikings. They were uh, one of the first missions that visited the red planet, and he was working on the development of some of the instrumentation in the scientific mission. And now you see how many of them we have. We have orbiters around it, and we also have rovers that are actually circulating around the surface and taking very, very promising data. This is, I think this is the curiosity taking a selfie of himself in the Martian land. And he's exploring a, a, the Gale Crater, which is uh, very interesting because there might be some evidences of water there and maybe life. And new rovers are being now developed, for example, by ESA, uh, that will be uh, launched in the uh, upcoming years. Okay, so we are back on Earth, we are back home, and it's uh, very uh, nice to see our own planet from, from the distance, uh, this characteristic blue color that is uh, given by the oceans, by the water, the essential element uh, that makes us be here, basically. And in this uh, part of the episode, Carl Sagan starts talking about the more uh, philosophical part that, again, that we should um, all be united, that we should take care of our legacy as a world, not only the natural richness, but also the cultural uh, human uh, richness. And I think it's the next one. Yeah, it's also another clip that I find very, very motivating because it's, it tells us that we should really try to preserve all the knowledge that 40,000 generations of humans have produced in all the time since modern humans are here. And I think it's also something that is very interesting to share with the students. But the matter of the cosmos has become alive and aware. There must be many such worlds scattered through space, but our search for them begins here with the accumulated wisdom of the men and women of our species acquired at great cost over a million years.
I really like this clip, all these aesthetics from the 80s. I think it's, it's really, uh, I feel nostalgic. I don't know, I, I like it a lot. And I think this relates uh, also very well with what we were talking and discussing yesterday in the workshop, no? again, to preserve the planet and to become ourselves a, a community which we can help each other. And from this point on, uh, what actually he's trying to, to make people understand is where do we come from? So how has the knowledge of humans evolved from the first moments uh, until now? And he, if you haven't seen the, the first episode and there are other episodes as well um, of, the, um, of the old cosmos, I invite you to do it because it has some representations of the library of Alexandria that are amazing. They're, they're no visual effects there, it's all done by models and it's really, really incredible. And he talks about the importance that he, this library had in the history of, of humanity. It was uh, the brain and the heart of the ancient world. And he presents us several uh, erudites, several wise, uh, people, men and women that work in that library and that made very important discoveries at a, barely, at a very early age. We are talking about more than 2000 years ago. Uh, but of course, uh, one of the main figures that he highlights is Eratosthenes and his calculation of the uh, circumfere of Earth. And I think this is a, a very actual today, especially with all the pseudosciences and all the people claiming that Earth is, uh, is not uh, round, that it's flat. So I think bringing back the Eratosthenes uh, is very important. And there is an amazing description of Eratosthenes experiment in this episode in Cosmos that I also, I don't think we have time to watch it now, but I also invite you uh, to, to watch it. I have put it here in the in the presentation, so you will have it. But it's a bit, a bit long, so I will not play it. Uh, but yeah, something that also Carl Sagan did was to try to fight against this pseudoscience. And I think, in that sense, he will be a bit disappointed today to see how many people actually believe the Earth is flat. I think he will go a bit crazy, but I'm sure he will tell us that uh, is over. A job as teachers, as science communicators, to uh, to try to explain people uh, why this is not correct and why science can uh, can um, have explanations that are based on scientific evidences and in scientific method that are much more um, convincing than the arguments that this pseudoscience can can provide. So this is a task for us, uh, probably in the future, to, to talk to these people and try to uh, make them on board of the scientific discoveries. And well, here is a list of uh, different uh, important people that worked in the library. Of course, Hipparchus of Nicaea for us astronomers is very important because he uh, prov produced the first stellar catalog um, containing the position of more than 800 stars. And not only that, but he also invented the scale of magnitudes that we are actually using nowadays, of course, has been uh, improved the system, uh, but it's based on the uh, system that was invented by Hipparchus. So very important figure for us, as well as Aristarco of Samos, uh, which um, in the episode, Carl Sagan, says that it's a pity that we could not have access to the books of Aristarco because it would, ha it would have been amazing how 2000 years ago, someone arrived to the conclusion that the earth is not the center of our universe, of our solar system, but the sun is the, the center of our solar system. Sadly, uh, most of the, of the uh, books in the, in the library and also Aristarchus' work was lost because of different fires that happened during uh, uh, subsequent centuries. And we also have indirect references of the book of Aristarco, but uh, we know that he arrived to that conclusion. 
And one of the latest figures, a very important figure uh, in the library was Hypatia of Alexandria for Carl Sagan, a symbol of culture and science in a moment that fanatism, a religious fanatism was increasing and was actually, actually persecuting all those that still claim that rational thinking was the way to go. And she was an astronomer, but also a philosopher, an inventor, a poet. So she actually did many things. She invented a, a densimeter, for example, to try to study the relative density or uh, densities of fluids. She also worked a lot with astrolabs and she improved the design of the primitive astrolabs. And she was uh, very well known at that epoch. And Socrates Escolastico, an historian from that time, says uh, that she reached such achievements in literature and science, science that she far surpassed all the philosophers of her own town, uh, time. She explained the principles of philosophy to her pupils. Many came from afar to receive her instruction. <clears throat> and not only that, but also many of the um, a political class of Alexandria have been also uh, students of Hypatia. But we all know uh, the tragic uh, end that uh, she had due to this uh, very um, influential uh, groups of fanatics that actually were uh, pursuing um, the, the, the few people that still believe it in rational thinking. And in the Western world, we had to wait many, many years until other people started uh, questioning uh, the system imposed by the church and by the religious institutions. And some of them were Copernico, Klepper, the ones that started understanding uh, the universe in a different way. And I'm just one to, um, no, don't want to go into details as well because I think I'm running out of time, but I just want to uh, mention uh, a modern uh, astrophysicist that is Havel, that um, he actually did very important discovery that uh, also Carl Sagan um, uh, uh, doesn't mention in the Cosmos series, but that was very important. Um, that is the expansion of the universe, looking at the velocity of the galaxies, looking at the movement of the galaxies in our vicinity, he was able to measure that the universe is expanding. And actually something that we have discovered in the last 40 years is that this, is a, this expansion is not only happening at a constant rate, at a constant velocity, but also we have discovered that it's accelerating. So the expansion of the universe is accelerating. It's going faster and faster every, every time. And this is something that was discovered in the late 90s, in 1988, by two different groups of astrophysics uh, that were actually working with supernovae. And they uh, measured this acceleration of the universe. So this is also something that we have been able to discover in the last decades. And I just want to mention this very, very quickly, uh, because it's something that Carl Sagan always used, and I think it's a very interesting tool. Uh, uh, for your students and that we, uh, we will see this afternoon in more detail with Rosa um, is the Cosmic Calendar. Cosmic Calendar is a fantastic uh, science outreach tool because it's, uh, it makes us have a clear view of how the universe has evolved uh, since the Big Bang. It's basically to condense the history of the universe in one year and try to scale all the events, important events uh, in, uh, in the universe in the different months of the calendar. So 13,800 million years ago, in January, the universe started. Uh, in February, we, we would have the first galaxies forming. In March, Milky Way would also form. And then we would have to wait quite some months until our star, which is a third generation star, uh, was formed from this huge uh, molecular cloud. The solar system was ready uh, in September and primitive Earth was formed in October. But until December, we don't find 
multicellular life. So even though we have primitive Earth, it was too hot uh, to harbor life. And the first life that it appeared was, of course, very simple. And we have to wait until December to uh, be able to, to this life to get more complex and eventually gave rise, rise to different species and uh, all the diversity that we see uh, in our planet today. And us as humans, we have just appeared on the last second of the last day of the year in this cos cosmic calendar. So every person you have ever heard of lived somewhere uh, in there. And this is also a message that Carl Sagan uh, wants to share with us that we are just, a, we have just appeared in the, in the cosmic calendar, but look at how many things we have discovered of our universe and how many things we are able, capable to do. So with this, I finish uh, my talk. If there, I don't know if there are time for questions, I hope so. Uh, yes, I leave you here a uh, um, summary of some of the things that I have mentioned, what we have discovered in these 40 years, uh, the exoplanets that are matter, the accelerating universe, we have explored the solar system uh, with much more detail, and of course in instrumentation, well, it's, we have done incredible uh, advances. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, please let me